A Purpose I really believe that God chooses people to do certain things, the way Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or Mozart or Muhammad Ali or Martin Luther King is chosen. And that is their mission to do that thing. And I think that I haven't scratched the surface yet of what my real purpose is for being here. I'm committed to my art. Michael Jackson 1993 Michael Jackson invited Oprah Winfrey for an interview at his home in February. When he told her he had a skin condition called vitiligo, I remembered noticing years ago that his hand on the Thriller album seemed covered in makeup. But when he said that no one seemed to worry about all the people getting tanned because they'd never been accused of changing their race, that struck me to the core. I thought the exact same thing when I heard all the rumors of Michael trying to be white. Even though Oprah was able to clear up many controversies surrounding Michael during that interview, when she asked him if he was spiritual, he didn't expand upon it. And that was one question I longed to hear the answer to. Elizabeth Taylor made an appearance and said he was very intuitive. When Oprah asked if he'd ever been in love, he said yes, with Brooke Shields and another girl. My heart leapt, but only for a moment. I'd be willing to bet millions of girls were wishing they were the other girl, even though he probably didn't realize it at the time. He did, however, say he was married to his work, and so there was no room for another. His work and life often took him into seclusion, and when Oprah asked him why he hadn't done an interview in 14 years, he simply replied, I had nothing to say. Personally, I think he was finding himself and coming to his own, there was a definite creative process flowing through him and into his music. He himself said that his music was God's work. No one can bring God's work to the table without first being prepared to receive him. The interview even touched on his dad. For the first time, I was given confirmation of why he might have said what he did when he was burned that day during the Pepsi shoot. The following day, a friend from group called to let me know she did some automatic writing. She said her guide told her to tell me that even though I thought I wanted to be with Michael, it would not necessarily happen, and that I didn't know what I was seeking being with him. What did they mean? I was sure we had a connection and questioned why they would say such a thing. I didn't let it stop me from speaking to him, though. I told him that the killing fields absolutely blew my mind. I couldn't believe that a few in power would murder thousands of innocent people. Then I told him that we'd need the strength of an elephant to make it through this tragedy, and then I wondered what I was talking about after I said it. I asked him to hold me almost nightly. I just wanted to feel him with me. Even though he wasn't there physically, I would hold his warm embrace as long as I could until I drifted off to sleep. Sometimes his face would seemingly pop out of nowhere when I thought of him, particularly when I said my prayers. I began to wonder if he could hear them. One night I told him I wasn't sure what to believe anymore because everything I heard was in such contrast to what I thought I knew. It was as if Michael was a different person in my thoughts and conversations from the person I saw portrayed in public. We talked about the rumors I heard. Sometimes I wondered if they were true. Like what? What rumors did you hear? No, I know. I don't want to talk about rumors. No, really. What did you hear? Well, like, you and Janet are actually the same person. There are a lot of things written in the papers that just don't make sense. Even how strange it is that you have Neverland. I see. Do you think Janet and I are the same person? I don't know. Sometimes I hear it so much I begin to wonder. But I don't think so. So why would they write that? At the time, my mother invited my teacher to do a home party at her house. We expected about ten to show up. I made up my mind that by then I would have enough courage to ask about Michael. I waited so that I was almost last in the evening. I weighed my question carefully, fully knowing how ridiculous it might sound, so I generalized it. There's someone I've been, um, communicating with. Yes? I'm just wondering if by chance this might be my twin flame soulmate. 
Yes, he's been waiting for you to find out. He responded so quickly and so definitively, it took me by surprise. I sat back in amazement with my mouth dropped to the floor. Does he even know who I'm talking about? What do you mean waiting for me to find out? I decided to tiptoe closer to zero in on the fact that it was Michael Jackson. So, he's black? Right. And famous? Yes. That's why he's been waiting. He wanted you to find out on your own. With that, I could feel my temperature rise and anger inside. All this time, I've been fooling myself, trying to get a handle on what's been going on. And he's been waiting? Why couldn't he just tell me? Why hasn't he approached me and talked to me? He doesn't have to. He already talks to you. My eyes narrowed. He doesn't have to? Shortly after, Michael was scheduled to appear at the Grammys where his sister, Janet, presented him with an award. I noticed they were both wearing white and began to laugh as he addressed the rumor of them being the same person. He continued talking about his childhood and how he hadn't really paid attention to all that was written about him in the papers. Perhaps I had opened his eyes. He went on to speak about healing the world. He said everything starts when we are children. The murderers, the priests, and the heads of state who start the world wars were all children at one time. We are all products of our childhood. If we only gave our children love, support, nurturing, and proper guidance, our world would change. He likened it to the beauty in nature and the playfulness of life. Then he explained how the magic, the wonder, the mystery, and the innocence of a child's heart are the seeds of creativity that will heal the world. There was that child's heart thing again. The Bible, Michael, and even St. Therese said it, so it must be true. That must be where we need to be to receive the beauty and magnificence meant for all of us. It's there that the bridge between where our consciousness is now and the consciousness of the I am of all things resides. Through the innocence, wonder, and imagination of a child, we will gain the consciousness of all things. By August, I had been continually getting antsy. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something seemed wrong, and I had unusually strong urge to reach out to Michael, not only in the spiritual sense, but the physical as well. Up until then, I was generally fine about not seeing him and couldn't understand the urgency of the feelings I was having. One night, I actually got up and wrote him a letter. It was two o'clock in the morning, and I could hardly believe I actually got out of bed. Anyone who was anyone in my life knew that sleep was one of my most prized activities. As I sat at the computer to compose something, it felt like I was dreaming. I decided to send him a book called Griffin and Sabine, about two people who'd never met, even though one could see what the other was drawing. It fit perfectly with our situation. I explained how I could see things from an early age, seemingly about him. I told him that I saw him with children, specifically on a hill in some sort of field, and then I told him about the nappy brown sofa I had seen from his childhood. By 2.30 a.m., I had completed the letter. I left no return address and no contact information, but the next morning, I sent the package from the post office. A few hours later, I scanned the television for something to watch and came across the news that Michael was being accused of child molestation. That must be why I felt the urgency to... Oh, my God. I wrote about children in the letter. I hoped they didn't think I was trying to say anything other than what I saw. As the week progressed, more and more news surfaced, and the man I thought I knew at some level seemed to turn into a monster I wasn't even vividly aware of. Investigators always cited his eccentricities, particularly the fact that he always wanted to be with children. I began to think that maybe my experiences resembled one of those horror movies where the psychic girl is connected to the murderer. Every station was following the story, and as more and more was revealed, I couldn't help but want to know the truth. Later that week, I lied down one evening and contacted him once again. How are you? I'm fine. Your life is a little crazy right now, huh? Yeah, I can't believe it. It's all over the news. There isn't a station that isn't commenting on it. 
I know. I know you had problems with your dad. Did something happen to you as a child? Did you do what they say you did? He didn't answer me, at least not in words. At that moment, I felt as if a freight train ran through me. Only it was Michael running through me and from me, but there was no place to go. He was a part of me, and both of us felt the pain I caused by doubting him. Every cell in my body left no question any longer as to his innocence. I began to cry and apologized profusely over and over again. I wanted with all my being for him to hear me, so I repeated the words, I'm sorry, until I no longer felt him trying to run. The next day I awoke with swollen eyes and a sick stomach. I couldn't eat or forgive myself for what I did to him. I was worried sick about him as well and didn't know how to make our relationship right. I saw him on a couch, not even wanting to move, staring out into space, as if someone sucked the life right out of him. I kept up with the news reports, hoping investigators would begin to rescind some of the stories and start reporting the truth. But they didn't. In fact, the reports just got worse. I would go to bed in the evenings and share with him the only way I knew how. How are you? Are you doing okay? I'll be fine. I can see what you mean about all the stories they make up about you. Oh my God, I can't believe what I heard on TV this evening. I was disgusted by all the injustice. They report only what they want. That's what they do. That's what makes it hard. They are attacking the one thing you care most about. Yeah, for money. Michael's birthday was around this time, so I made a point to check on him, think of him, get a picture and see that he was okay. I saw him lying on a couch again, and Elizabeth Taylor was with him. She had a quick wit and an ability to get through to him that I probably would not have had if I'd been there. I saw her bringing him a small round white cake with white frosting. What a small cake for such a big star, I thought, assuming a crowd of people was due to arrive to celebrate his birthday. I felt helpless, but at the same time, eternally grateful to Elizabeth Taylor for having the courage, grace, and strength to be such a good friend to him during this time. I promised myself that I would thank her one day if the opportunity surfaced. For me, all I could do was pray for the truth and send him my thoughts each day. You are not alone. We might be far apart, but you are always in my heart. I'm right here with you. In the evenings, I began to see a man's hand beside my bed, but it wasn't Michael's or Father Solanus. The hand was wearing a ring that resembled a class ring or a Freemason ring with a ruby in it. I still couldn't see a face, but when I asked him who he was, he didn't answer me. I did notice, however, that every time I reached out to Michael, the hand would be there. <laughs>